Hello viewers, welcome to CC lectures on genetics. If we pick up the thread from the history of genetics part 1, wherein we had talked about Needham's experiment, where uh, the spontaneous generation was tried to be formulated and uh, it was found that uh, this particular experiment was full of experimental errors. So, these experiments were challenged by uh, an Italian scientist Lazzaro Sfalenzini, who was really not convinced about the uh, sterilization techniques and the methodology of Needham. He used a slightly different protocol with perhaps a longer boiling time which was to ensure that the microbes which at all were there would be completely killed and then one would really see whether spontaneous generation was a possibility. And uh, he did not have any microbes in his sealed flask after a prolonged boiling. So, if we look at the experiment of uh, Spallanzini, we find uh, that the, the uh, vessels which are sealed uh, after boiling for a long time, they do not uh, have any contamination at all. And uh, another scientist, who, uh, an Italian biologist, uh, he is also called as the founder of uh, experimental biology, Francesco Redi. He incidentally is also called as the father of modern parasitology. He also demonstrated through a little more sophisticated experiments that maggots were the offspring of flies and not the products of spontaneous generations as uh, uh, prophesized by uh, the earlier scientists like Needham. So, he took two jars, one was open and the other was cloth covered and then he demonstrated that the dead maggots of flies would not generate new flies at all when placed on a rotting meat in a sealed jar, whereas the live maggots would or the flies they would. So, this uh, idea totally disapproved the existence of some essential component, some mystical component uh, in the uh, in the once living organisms which also was there after their death and uh, the necessity of fresh air keeping everything open to generate life. If we look at uh, some of the classical experiments which were performed by Francisco Reddy, they suggest that the open container would have all sorts of maggots and the ones which are uh, covered uh, would not have any contamination at all. So, this classical experiment disproved uh, any further notion of spontaneous generation. <clears throat> then came uh, the famous Louis Pasteur, the French scientist who is also uh, called as the father of microbiology, although uh, some people like to call Anthony von Leeuwenhoek as the father of microbiology, but then that is a debatable point. Uh, he was a person who performed a certain very elegant, unique swan neck flask experiments, which now laid the spontaneous theory of origin of life uh, finally to rest. And his famous swan like experiments were when a broth was boiled and the swan neck was, uh, was sealed, then there was absolutely no contamination and if the swan neck was broken, then perhaps the microbes would have entered and uh, they uh, caused the contamination. Now, this was a very elegant experiment and proved uh, beyond doubt uh, the uh, negation of spontaneous generation. So, in one of his lectures, Pasteur uh, very avidly um, articulated, he used the term omne vivum ex vivo, which says that life only comes from life. Uh, 
So, he recounted his famous swam lake experiment during an award winning ceremony and he said that life is a germ and a germ is life. So, that means his experiments were the final uh, nail in the coffin of spontaneous generation theory. Then came a German scientist who gave the idea of epigenesis. Now, epigenesis also is a theory which negates the concept of preformation. He said that the structures they arise during development and are not already preformed. However, he is not mentioning anything about the blueprint which is there. He talked about the idea of neo formationism. He just suggested that many organs and tissues which were originally absent, they develop subsequently fine, but how he was not able to explain very convincingly. But the theory states that the egg and sperms are differentiated cells. The differentiation into various organs and parts takes place only after fertilization in the zygote and then thereafter the this mass of identical cells they would differentiate in due course of time to give rise to tissues or organs. Uh, we should now assume that uh, the genetics till now that we have studied is not uh, suddenly developed. Today that we are talking about the advances in all the modern aspects of genetics it has been actually a product or a consequence of various contributions in different fields which has helped it really to metamorphose. If one talks about a, an analogy, we would say that it is truly polyphyletic in origin and we find that four scientists with a very common surname alphabet which is starting from L have shaped the destiny of modern genetics. The first L is naturally uh, Leeuwenhoek because he opened a new window towards the study of microbes, the study of, uh, of sperms, the study of ova and uh, this ultimately led to the formulation of cell theory and the, the vision of uh, the chromosomes and uh, the cell division mitosis and meiosis. And then the second L in the form of father of taxonomy Carlos Linnaeus who also grouped the organisms into various hierarchical forms. Now, various hierarchical forms here have a relevance because one can ask a, a, a very interesting question, why are the ants and the maggots closely related? as they are not related to an elephant. The idea perhaps would be uh, that uh, they are deviating from the phylogenetic tree much much earlier. Now, the answer to this perhaps was given by Lamarck. However, Lamarck himself faltered in the mechanism as to how this would have happened and that would be uh, our next topic of discussion that is the theory of uh, acquired characters. And so, the third uh, L is Lamarck who was a true evolutionary biologist or the first evolutionary biologist in a true sense and he gave the theory of acquired characters and of course, Lyell. Lyell was a, a, a British uh, geologist and an advocate and he had talked about the origin of earth and the origin of species to be much much older than what was mentioned in the biblical writings. So, that means his ideas were really revolutionary and once we think that the species and the earth has uh, has originated much much earlier then we have to think in terms of, of uh, evolution. It may uh, be interesting for you to know that uh, Charles Darwin was so impressed by the work of Lyell that during his journey to the Galapagos Islands by, uh, by the famous HMS Beagle, among the books that he had for reading uh, 
was one of the Lyle's books which said the principles of geology so, and he was always referring to the book when he was looking at the new species in a new geographical area. So, this idea of, uh, of mystical forces, the, the forces of, uh, of some sort of a homunculus, they were all laid to rest uh, a little later when came the particulate theories which had their own flaws of course and uh, it was presented in a different form. The first of them was inheritance of acquired characters which was by uh, the French uh, Jean Baptiste Lamarck. He always challenged the biblical account of special creation and he was as I said earlier he was the first modern evolutionist and he said that uh, the idea of the origin of a new character would be acquired by variation, but then this would be inherited in toto in the next generation. His ideas were absolutely brilliant, but then the mechanism that he put forth was absolutely erroneous. Uh, Charles Darwin, the great English naturalist who was the author of the book The Origin of Species was uh, also of the opinion that uh, there is something called as pan genesis. He got, gave the idea that the animal body produces many minute particles known as gemmules. Now, these gemmules basically would be collected in the blood. So, he was also talking about concentration of the blood and uh, from the blood they would go and get concentrated in the reproductive organs. So, that means when an animal is going to reproduce into a new individual, these gemmules would naturally pass onto it and blending of both the parents would take place. Now, the word blending is a, is a very dangerous one in the present context because blending would mean that uh, something like a blue and, uh, and a white color or uh, let us say a red and a white color giving rise to pink and uh, not uh, coming back to red or white either. So, that means uh, uh, this theory of band genesis uh, which uh, was given by uh, Darwin uh, said that uh, every part of the body or every cell of a body is going to produce a gemmule and the pangene will pass into the gametes. So, in a way Darwin's idea of pangenesis was only a modern version of uh, Hippocrates brick and mortar concept which we uh, have already mentioned was, was not a right one. So, that means the blending of the gemmules of the sperm and egg occurring in an embryo would give rise to an intermediate uh, uh, individual perhaps. So, how does one explain variation in evolution? Uh, it is very interesting to know that uh, Darwin never explained how the, the exact mechanism of, uh, of uh, heredity takes place or a new species takes place and it is really ironical. Only if Darwin had opened the reprint sent to him by Gregor Johann Mendel, he would have perhaps been forced to change his opinion and he would have explained his ideas better because Mendel had said that factors are discrete units, but Darwin never opened that paper and he stuck to the idea of, of blending inheritance which was an erroneous one. The famous uh, German scientist August Weismann was the creator of what is called as the germ plasm theory. Now, this was a much much more scientific one because he said that the body of the organisms contain distinctly two type of cells, the somatic cells and the reproductive cells. So, that means the reproductive cells would be grouped under germplasm that means the sperms and the ova. Whereas, these germplasm would have 
all the hereditary characters which are now confined to the gametes that is the sperms and the ova and it is will be these characters which will be transmitted from generation to the generation and all the other uh, cells other than the germ plasm would be grouped in somatoplasm and their characters are not going to be transferred to the next generation. One very important aspect was that the somatic cells could disappear with the death of the individual. So, any changes which are affecting in the somatic characters may not be heritable at all. So, this idea was absolutely opposite to uh, Lamarckian uh, hypothesis. So, that means according to Weismann the germ plasm could give rise to somatoplasm, but it would never be vice versa and that means if there are environmentally induced changes in the somatic cells, they could uh, influence the other somatic cells but then they would never influence the reproductive cells. We always talk about the nature and nurture in genetics fine, but then if the changes which are environmentally induced till they are not incorporated into the genome, how would they be transmitted into the next generation again is a uh, matter of discussion. To substantiate his theory, he performed some very interesting experiments. Weismann cut the tails of the male and the female mice and these parents with cut tails when they littered and gave rise to the smaller mice, the progeny mice, all these mice had their tails intact and this experiment was repeated up to 72 generations just to find out whether there was uh, a creeping experimental error, but the it was 100 percent foolproof. That means, all the mice in the subsequent generations had tails. So, that means by such experiment he absolutely rejected the uh, Lamarckian theory and also the pangenesis theory which was given by uh, Darwin. So, that means if one really summarizes the pangenesis theory and the germ plasm theory, one would reach a conclusion that pan genes would mean that all the, the characters are now being transmitted from the blood of the various organs of the body and now they are concentrating into the, the, the reproductive cells and then finally going to the next generation. Whereas, germ plasm theory is very very discreet it says that the characters which are present in the reproductive cells only they are the ones which are exclusively responsible for transmission of characters to the next generation. So, if we just summarize the ideas that were prevalent prior to Mendel, we find that uh, the parents of contrasting characters would always produce offsprings of intermediate appearance. This was the concept of most of the breeders and uh, based on this idea they assumed that uh, the offspring would have traits of both the parents. Naturally, they, it was uh, right for them to think because they had absolutely no knowledge of cells or chromosomes as to how do they segregate and go to the next generation. And if there was a reappearance of the exact parental trait, they attributed it to uh, simply genetic instability. They attributed to genetic instability. So, that means it was something like a, 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 an exception. Darwin although he recognized that heredity was fundamental to evolution and he made genetic crosses with pigeons, but then he never understood the nature of inheritance and he was sticking to the idea of, of blending inheritance of the pan genes. So, this was a major omission in his uh, theory of uh, 
evolution as far as the origin of species is concerned and he even advocated in during the later parts of his life when there was a big uh, criticism of of the mechanism that he was advocating he even advocated then the blending of gemmules so that means things were uh, were out again in oblivion and then finally uh, we talk about the work of gregor johann mendel the simple looking austrian monk uh, who was born in uh, heisendorf uh, now is in austria uh, then it was in austria now it is in the czech republic and uh, his life is extremely uh, very interesting and forms a good biography and an inspiration for the young scientists he was a brilliant student and he studied philosophy and imagine in 1843 when he joined the augustinian monastery of saint thomas in 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 a small town of brun in moravia which is now in the czech republic he joined at the age of 21 and uh, he was adorned by the name uh, gregor and uh, he was uh, very soon exempted from uh, indulging in most of the uh, religious teachings because he was a brilliant student he was uh, he was promoted for his researches in science his experiments in science and in 1851 he was sent to the university of vienna in austria to study physics and botany incidentally he was exposed to some of the best minds of professors during that time at the university of vienna incidentally he also started his interest in mathematics and his whole approach of uh, uh, to science was influenced by the great physics professor uh, christian uh, doppler and uh, we know the one who gave the doppler effect and uh, that means when he was back after 3 years in 1854 he started teaching botany physics and mathematics for the next 16 years of course along with his religious duties in the monastery uh, uh, on the right you could see a photograph of uh, of a small garden which was uh, there at the at the monastery of saint thomas where the ideas of the mendel's laws uh, took birth and now he started breeding experiments on albino and colored mice in the monastery and uh, people uh, did not like the idea of foul smell coming from the monastery so uh, he was he, he was literally barred to work on animals mm, he took up the challenge and started working on on plants and later therefore he switched on to the work on plants and mainly on the garden pea which is pisum uh, sativum and so he was given a small patch as you saw in the photograph and uh, he started his experimental work on on garden pea he performed hybridization experiments for literally 7 years and he faithfully recorded the statistical data of every cross that he made every failure that he encountered and uh, then he also collected the seeds and labeled them and kept them properly for future reference 7 years of research painstaking research in culminated in the year 1865 when he gave a lecture on the experiments before an audience at the meeting of the natural history society of brun wherein all the locals were collected and they were given discourses on the achievements of science now uh, his biographer says that he was not a very good orator so perhaps his ideas they bored the audience and on top of it the uh, the the whole lecture was full of of uh, experimental data statistical data and of uh, means so that means it did not incite the audience at all Uh, so he said maybe now let me just go out and reach out to the scientific community of the world and in 1866 he published a paper in german which was entitled versuche uber pflanzen hybriden which in english means experiments in plant hybridization and uh, there was a journal coming out from the natural history society which was proceedings of the natural history society of brun uh, 
and uh, imagine about 40 scientists were uh, uh, sent uh, this paper in an envelope all over the world including Darwin and Nageli. But then there was hardly any response to his paper and this paper went absolutely in, uh, in um, oblivion and it was absolutely uh, lost. Uh, in our next series perhaps we talk about how the lost paper was unearthed, how the lost was found and how Mendel was acclaimed as the father of genetics. Thank you.